the topic today is very broad. It's the future of civil rights for American Muslims. And we have a panel of experts here for you. My job today is to talk as less as I can. And so the plan is for them to do most of the talking. Um, we have a lot of different uh, panelists with a lot of varied experience. So the plan is as follows. We're going to give each person an opportunity to speak for five minutes to cover any ground that they want to cover. We've had a chance to talk in advance. And then we're going to go into a couple of moderated Q&As, and if there's time, also audience Q&As. And to the extent we're running very short on time, I'll hold back my questions and I'll turn it over to the audience, but I'll direct them. I'm going to hold the panelists to our five minutes because it's critical that we might manage time as best as we can. I'm going to do the introductions one by one so that it stays with you as to who is from where, their background, and why we should all be lending them an ear. Obviously, the time for us is very interesting. Elections are coming up next year, and every election is important, and this is almost one of the most important ones of our lifetimes. So with that, I'm going to go get started. Um, so our first panelist is Haroon Azar, just to my right. Haroon is a senior fellow at the UCLA Berkel Center for International Relations and the former program director for the center's initiative on security and religious freedom. Previously, Haroon was the deputy director for the Middle East, Africa, and South Asia at the US Department of Homeland Security, among other very senior roles at the department. Currently, Haroon is a partner at the Rosalind Group and teaches national security and civil liberty courses at UCI School of Law. Haroon also sits on the national board of the Afghan American Foundation. He received his JD, Jur Juris Doctor, from the UCLA School of Law, where he focused on the intersection of national security and civil rights. Haroon, you've got five minutes. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you. Thank you for that. It sounds like a, you know, speed dating here. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to try to get in as much as possible. Thank you to MPAC and everybody for having us. Uh, so. As you heard, I, I, I came from the federal government, and I just want to set the scene a little bit for what we have experienced as a community in the last month, and potentially how, or at least somebody like me, and from my vantage point, what I'm seeing as uh, potential uh, early warnings uh, of uh, other circumstances that we've had. So I think most, uh, most everyone in this room uh, except my son and other children, uh, obviously remember September 11th. And so every time we've had a national security incident like that, certain things have happened in the United States. And one side of that coin is what the response is from a legal, constitutional perspective from our government, what type of uh, potential problematic programs uh, or initiatives that are being launched. The other side is just from a community side what we're going through. So myself as an Afghan American, for example, when 9-11 hit, uh, or hit, sorry, when 9-11, the incidents of 9-11 happened, unfortunately, um, you know, we were worried about our family in Afghanistan, and we were obviously worried about our family here from a... Uh, from a surveillance perspective, from a civil rights, civil liberties perspective, from a personal security perspective. And this trauma is something that I highlight because when we're operating in these tense times, all of us, whether we're Somali, Syrian, uh, African American, whatever community we come from, we come from it from our own traumas. And those traumas sometimes get triggered with the events we are seeing. And so in, in, in some instances, that trauma is, t is being taken advantage of. And so what I wanted to highlight is when some of these incidents have occurred, we've had security, the security apparatus of this country start adjusting. So I'm going to throw out something. We have some civil rights attorneys uh, here on the, on the panel as well. So I'm going to throw out some terms. Maybe we'll get back to them. But for example, um, we had the Patriot Act. We had uh, and Patriot Act loosened uh, the government's uh, a bar for surveillance. We had NSEERS, which is putting a ban on uh, individuals traveling from certain countries. M material support statutes, which uh, f folks got tied up with, you know, with, you know, from everything from, um, you know, saying something to the wrong person or uh, organizations and charities who, who uh, got caught up in, in material support statutes. 
increased surveillance, the use of informants, no fly lists, detentions, deportations. And then around the time of ISIS, we had the left of boom programs countering violent extremism. How can we prevent radicalization? How can we prevent some of this stuff that are happening more from a social science perspective? So all of this was from, how much, how am, I, how am I doing on time? Sorry, you're like, you're right here. Okay, I'm gonna relax a little. Uh, so these are some of the instruments that the, the government and the national security apparatus uh, enacted and uh, they are still there. They are still there. Uh, some of them have gone away like NSEERS uh, and others, but for the most part they are there. And when a lot of these, uh, these programs get, um, get congressional approval, they're there. They're just inactive. And, or, you know, depending on the administration, and we talked a little bit about, you know, elections in the previous panel, so always think about that, right? Depending on however we're feeling on foreign policy, maybe that person, the next person is bad on foreign policy, but what does that mean for domestically for our, for our audience here? What does that mean for our youth on college campuses, right? And so the framework that, you know, how, how we respond as a community, and these are big, large buckets, legal, right? legal funds. I think right now we are seeing students on campus, we are seeing professionals in the workplace uh, who are in need desperately of legal representation. Uh, I'm, I'm counseling a few lawyers who's, uh, a few of them are on probation based on their uh, social media posts. So we have stuff like that. Political, right? Why is it not a liability for anybody to speak in inhumane terms as it relates to our community? What is the, why is there no political liability for that individual when they speak like that? These are questions we must ask. Financial, we talked about the big tent in the last session. Is our tent as the American Muslim community large enough to be able to include other allied uh, uh, communities but are also our own, who we may not see eye to eye from a fiqh perspective, but hey, they still uh, love and support some of the same issues. Spiritual, I think it's extremely important. How do we not lose hope? How do we not lose hope in these, in, these, uh, uh, in these circumstances? It's vitally important, specifically for our youth. Those of us who have lived through circumstances like this, we need to provide that, that, uh, that, the, uh, that previous uh, experience we've had with some of these problematic issues. And lastly, educational. We have to be the smartest people in the room on these issues. There's no, there's no excuse. If you're not the smartest person on, you know, on these issues, then you know, we're going to be caught flat-footed every time. I'll stop there, and inshallah, you know, in the, in the question, and, question and answer, I'll try to address some of the more. Excellent. Five minutes, 38 seconds, alhamdulillah. Um, I think I'm making everybody jittery, so I'm not going to be looking at the panelists as they speak. No, you so just you guys... had a time clock sitting next to me, <laughs> breathing down my So I'm going to be looking the other way from now on, so I'm not making everybody. The topic is already pretty heavy. Last thing you need is a moderator who's trying to impose more, more on you. All right. Um, thank you, though. Very succinct. Really appreciate it. Our next panelist is Dina Shehada. Dina is a civil rights managing attorney for CARE LA. Dina specializes in direct legal services to American Muslims facing religious discrimination in a vast area of matters, including employment, travel, education, interaction with law enforcement, and the FBI, and as well as public accommodations, prisons, as well as advocating for victims of hate crimes and hate incidents. Dina has also worked with organizations to address the intersectionality of national security and civil rights. All right, thank you. So, bismillah, alhamdulillah, I'm going to start um, in the name of God and in gratitude to God. I came prepared and I'm going to talk fast. Um, so, you know, I'm really grateful to be in this space right now and in this community because I know so many of us are feeling very isolated and betrayed by mainstream voices. And when I think about the state of civil rights for American Muslims, I always contextualize it by how civil rights was born in this country. So we know that civil rights in this country was born out of a struggle in response to things like the brutality of Jim Crow and the savagery of slavery. And alongside that and preceding that, uh, our own genocide of the indigenous people of this land. And so every single one of these episodes in American history really is made possible by dehumanizing a group of people. And Muslims are very familiar to dehumanization because we have been historically otherized in the United States um, and reduced to sort of these absurd caricatures, whether you're thinking all the way back to Orientalism 
or the clash of civilizations, which taught people that Islam is incompatible with Western civilization, um, we've been homogenized and we've been robbed of our humanity and the diversity of who we are as people. And the steady diet of dehumanization has been fed to the West about Muslims and it's the very same diet that's being fed to Zionists and Israelis about Arabs. And it's being fed to so many people around the earth about so many vulnerable groups. But at this moment in time, I can't talk about the state of civil rights for Muslims right now without talking about Gaza and Palestine, okay? Because what we're seeing in real time right now is that this sickness is infecting our American officials, our governments, our institutions, the vast majority of our media. It's embodied in the right wing, ethnocratic, racist, Zionist ideology. It's destroying the soul of our government and so many of the European governments that right now are capitulating to Netanyahu. And so I wanna say that this sickness is why right now at work, Shaheen can attest to it, he's also with CARE, we're seeing an avalanche of hate, bias, discrimination against Muslims. So just to give you a very real idea about what's happening on the ground, from October 8th to November 8th, I am seeing in my civil rights department a 300% increase in bias incidents against us, against our community. That's a 300% increase from the very month preceding or the same period last year. And to give you examples of that, I'm seeing people being physically assaulted, verbally threatened, threatened by imminent harm or death. I'm seeing people terminated and losing their livelihoods for expressing solidarity with Palestine. I'm seeing students and professionals being doxxed. And I'm seeing children, children from K through 12 being called terrorists, being bullied, being demeaned and denigrated by their faculty and by their teachers. And I'm seeing young activi activists uh, you know, um, threatened in the most obscene ways. We're seeing a war cry right now by certain organizations to treat young activ activists as terrorists, to investigate them as terrorists. We all know what's been happening with Students for Justice in Palestine, in Florida, in Colombia, to Jewish Voice for Peace, this issue does not discriminate. So I'm not going to mince my words, and I'm getting, to, I'm getting there. I'm not gonna mince my words. This is a really, really heavy time for our community. Okay, we're witnessing this horror unfolding in Gaza, and then we have to deal with the repercussions here, which are not looking great. And we have this insurmountable challenge before us. And I think this moment is going to call for great courage. And we all know that courage is not the, fe is not the absence of fear, but courage is being able to stand or to speak or to act in the presence of fear and in the face of this unbelievable evil and darkness. So I wanna tell my community and everyone that I work with and I represent and I fight for all of you to take heart because inshallah, verily with every hardship will come ease. And I really strongly believe that. SubhanAllah. That was amazing. That's under your time. You have a minute and I'll give you more <laughs> during Q&A. Thank you for that. That's outstanding. And I swear I was looking at you because I was wasn't, wasn't time. It literally was incredible what you just said. Pressure, but yeah, thank you. Really good. Thank you so much. All right. To Dina's, to Dina's right is Dr. Marguerite Hill. Marguerite is a co-founder and executive director of Muslim Anti-Racism Collaborative, Muslim ARC. She's a human rights educate, which is a human rights education organization. Marguerite is also a freelance writer published in the How We Fight White Supremacy in Time, in Huffington Post, and in Al Jazeera English. Marguerite's research includes, among other things, inter-ethnic relations in Muslim communities, anti-bias, K through 12 education, and the criminalization of black Muslims. For her work, she has received numerous awards, including CARES 2020 Muslim of the Year Award, as well as MPAC's 2015 Changemaker Award. She has given talks and lectures in various universities and community centers throughout the country. Marguerite earned her master's degree in history of, in the history of Middle East and Islamic, Af Islamic Africa from Stanford University in 2005. Thank you, go ahead. Thank you. I mean, this is such a beautiful room and um, thank you for, for the introduction, Dina. Thank you, and thank you for fighting for me because when you're even doing, on, doing this work, um, they are coming after our families. So, and I don't want to speak anymore on that, but you know, we can follow up. 
But I, I want to kind of like maybe just do a brief survey of the crowd, like where we are from, right? So how many of the folks here are, um, have, whose families, their own heritage, come from the African continent? So if you can raise your hand. So we have, we have some of our folks from the African continent. Thank you. So raise your hand if you're, your lineage, you're of, um, from the Asian continent. Okay, so we have that. Um, thank you, thank you. I mean, this is, and this is the beauty, right, of Islam, like what this brings, like this is a blessing for me. Now, okay, because like, I don't like, Europe is not a continent, okay? So um, it's a peninsula of Asia. And I do have, like I did European studies. So how many of you, like if anybody in this space are descendants of folks from the Asian peninsula that we call Europe? You know, raise your hand. <laughs> If you're there, okay, so, so that's just really beautiful. So, so if we're seeing that, that's reflecting of the diversity, right? The beauty of the diversity of the American Muslim community and who, who we bring together in our work. We are the most racially diverse religious community. And so that means that when it comes down to issues, oh, and I did it for you, like how many of folks who come from, whose family heritage comes from either Central America, South America and the Caribbean. Raise your hand if you have some. Okay, you know me, gente. We're like, we're here. We're representing. So that's like really, um, just really beautiful, like what we have in this space. So, so our issues are Latino issues. Our issues are African and African American issues. Our issues are Asian American issues. All of these communities have had hundreds of years of experience, right, of civil rights violations. Every right that we have in this country has had to be fought for. That includes an eight hour work day, making sure that our children can um, get an education as opposed to just being worked in industrial factories. That includes voting rights. And we see that there's always some forces that would like, love to disenfranchise our community, regard, especially in terms of our racial community, but we know that in this society, in this country, it was, they only afforded citizenship rights to those who were of European and Christian background. And so even to be, to open those doors, to have the diversity that we have in this room as American Muslims, that was, came out of the civil rights movement. So when we're thinking about the future of American Muslims, like what is the future of our civil rights is absolutely dependent upon the coalitions that we build with our co-religionists and even more so with people in our, our communities. That's with the black, Latino, and Asian communities. We're talking about issues where we're experiencing as Muslims some of the greatest disparities in housing, in medical, the medical apartheid, in voting rights, even the rights of non-citizens. These are things are civil rights issues, education and access, and they're being encroached upon by those who want to silence the voices of those um, of Palestine. There are many of those, the people that are seeing us as a threat, the ethno-religious nationalism that we have in this country, it's affecting our folks globally. And we have to think globally, but we have to act lo locally and make sure that we form coalitions and educate people in our communities. So let's go to the Asian American communities and build that work. That is the core of how we're gonna get free and that's gonna help us build the strength in our continual struggle and secure our place as American Muslims for generations to come. Outstanding, thank you. Less than five minutes as well, thank you, Dave. Great, powerful words, very succinctly shared by everyone, really, really amazing. So, uh, to Marguerite's right is Faisal Kuti. Faisal is a lawyer, law professor, and writer. Faisal has extensive experience in interfaith and, inter and intercultural dialogue and is an expert on Islamic law, Islamic culture, national security, and their intersections. Faisal currently teaches at Southwestern Law School and previously taught at Valparaiso Law School in Indiana, as well as Canada's largest law school, Osgold, Osgood Hall Law School. Faisal has published more than 250 articles in newspapers, magazines, and academic publications on various topics including Islamophobia, human rights, national security, multiculturalism, constitutional law, international affairs, and others. 
The festival has also received numerous awards, and he's been quoted and featured in many media stories around the world. So, Faisal, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. So I want to thank Impact for organizing this panel. You might have to use your taser on me because I, once I get started, I, it's hard to stop. Okay. So um, I also want to thank Impact. As a Canadian, I was missing the cold, and this room makes me feel right at home. So thank you very much. Um, and one other thing I want to tell Impact is for next uh, event, maybe you should stop using these chairs with this many lawyers you might get a lawsuit if somebody flips over, okay? I'm, so just, I'm a, I'm a lawyer warned. as well, and they told me this was a 300-pound limit, and I haven't had breakfast or lunch so that I don't break the chair. Yeah, but I, yeah, I, go ahead. I'm, I'm scared to move on this, okay? And I like to move when I'm talking. So if I fall, you guys are all witnesses. Uh, any, any lawsuit victories, I will contribute back to the cause, though, all right? So I want to talk about what we, can, what we can do going forward to improve the, the civil rights situation in the country. I come from Canada. I was one of the co-founders of CARE in Canada uh, just before 9-11, and also another civil rights group. So at that, in those days, we were very new. We didn't have any real institutions. So the org when 9-11 happened, we didn't know how to handle it. We were reactionary. We didn't have the organizations. And we uh, had very few professionals. But what happened now in this, with this recent October 7th incident, what I realize is we haven't improved that much. We're reactionary. Our advocacy groups and our organizations are not well-funded. We don't have the resources, right? The, the way that our students are being targeted, people, are, employees are being targeted, lawyers are being shut down, but we don't have the capacity to respond because we are still, our community is still focused on bricks and mortar projects. What I mean by that, just, I was just at a mosque, I'm not gonna name the mosque yesterday. Given the situation we're in, the, the speaker was raising money, millions of dollars, for an Islamic school, important cause. But is that the priority in this day and age when we are institutions, we don't have institutions that can actually address? My inbox and on LinkedIn, on social media is, is full. Because I'm in the United States now, I'm getting messages from Canadian side and American side of students who have been kicked out of class, of employees being terminated, people being told not to say anything when their bosses are posting all kinds of stuff on social media, including kill them all. We can't even speak out against that, right? So we feel weak because why? Our institutions are not there to respond. We put together a group in, in, in Toronto, 75 lawyers volunteered to work, pro bono. They're going to do that for about two weeks, three weeks, and guess what? They're going to get burned out. We don't have the institutional backing. We need to fund our institutions. No more bricks and mortar projects. We should be directing our funds to these projects. We have a lot of professionals, alhamdulillah. 9-11 happened, I remember, we used to joke about it. Uh, in Canada, as I said, I, I was one of the co-founders of CARE, and we were known as three guys on a fax machine. That's all we could do. We could just fax out stuff, put out statements, but we couldn't do anything. Now, we're a lot more advanced. I mean, we have MPAC and we have CARE, especially in the United States, you're much more sophisticated. But thank God for the work that our African-American community did in the past. We are not appreciated. We don't understand the amount of work they've done because where we are today is because of that work. And I can speak from experience in Canada right now. Everybody thinks Canada is a great country. It is a great country. But the amount of civil rights violations that are taking place, led by the government there, and there are no institutions being able to speak up there. Here, at least, you have the ACLU. You have the Center for Constitutional Rights. You have all these Muslim groups. In Canada, I have an article coming out in Toronto Star tomorrow talking about every single civil society group in Canada is silent. Not a word. So I called them out. And when I wrote that article, I submitted it to the editor. The editor was like, whoa, you're calling out names of organizations. We can't publish it. This is the editor of the Toronto Star. I said, you have to publish this because every single group is silent. You're at a right? minute? Every single group is silent. And now he's trying to silence me, right? <laughs> I'm, so, I'm just not wanting to use the taser, to. that's all. He has to. But yeah, go ahead. So I went back and I said, look, 
why is the Canadian Civil Liberties Association quiet on the suppression of speech? Why is the Canadian Bar Association silenced when lawyers are being shut out? And I went to four redrafts. Eventually, after telling him, look what they're doing in the United States, at least, all these groups are speaking out. He decided finally, after the fourth draft, he's going to publish it tomorrow. Right? But the amount of effort it takes to do this, and the fact that our community is so poor and weak on these institutions, we need to focus on funding. And I'm, pre I'm, I'm preaching to the, to the converted here, but we need to go out there to the, to the general public, Muslims, and say, look, it's time to have legal advocacy groups, to fund them well, so they're not going around begging, and have think tanks that can convince people that d definition changing, you know ADL, and I'll finish with this, the ADL, uh, on October 25th, I went on their website. It said River to the Sea was kind of, it's, an, it's a pro-Palestinian, anti-Israeli uh, slogan. On October 26th, they change it. It's anti-Semitic. And then everybody starts following it now, right? Where are think tanks pointing this out, questioning this, challenging this? So with that, inshallah, I hope we learn from the, our experiences from the past, from history, and benefit from all the hard work that our other communities have done and built on it, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. That was, that was excellent. I'm supposed to be doing the fundraising pitch for MPAC later. Maybe I'll have you switch in my place. Um, that would be great, honestly. Very well stated. All right, our last speaker, and again, thank you for everybody indulging us. I want to do the bios in deliberate, in very deliberate manner because I want to hear, I want you all to hear how Im incredible each one of these people are. And so I'm um, taking a little bit of time on that. Shaheen uh, Nassar is a community organizer at CARE, at CARE LA. In his role at CARE, uh, he's responsible for community outreach, volunteer engagement, and event planning for various departments. Shaheen is a graduate of UC Riverside and, a bachelor, and with a bachelor's degree in ethnic studies. He has been a political activist for several years for various human rights and global justice causes. He frequently hosts workshops and teachings on social justice issues, and he was involved in what many of you here know as the Irvine 11, which I do want him to talk about as well in his opening. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Uh, thanks to MPAC for hosting this wonderful conversation. Um, so, yeah, I was a member of the Irvine 11, uh, where I was arrested along with uh, 11, or 10 other of my colleagues at school uh, for basically uh, speaking truth to power and voicing the Muslim community's outrage at the continuous violence that the Palestinian people are experiencing. So unfortunately, unlike my fellow panelists, um, I don't have any legal uh, expertise to contribute, but I've been on the other side of the legal equation. <laughs> Not by choice, of course, but because of the uh, selective prosecution and selective enforcement policies by a certain biased uh, OCDA. Um, but what I wanted to say is that during these difficult times, uh, I'm reminded of uh, verse number eight from Surah Al-Ma'da in which Allah Azza wa Jal instructs us to be steadfast, to be steadfast in the pursuit of justice. And it's as if Allah Azza wa Jal is telling us that we're going in the pursuit of justice, in uh, the pursuit of equity, we're going to experience hardship, we're going to experience suffering, and that's exactly what we're witnessing. And what I also wanted to offer is the perspective of, of a Palestinian Muslim American, someone who is from Gaza, someone who has family in Gaza, uh, on, on what's happening. And um, some of the things I wanted to mention, uh, for example, is notable historian and Holocaust expert, uh, Professor Raz Segal, as well as Professor uh, Omer Bartov, have both designated uh, the atrocities that we're witnessing on social media as a textbook case of genocide that is indisputable, that it is an absolute uh, atrocity that uh, deserves worldwide condemnation. And yet, our entire political establishment and our mainstream media are throwing their entire weight behind uh, this Zionist narrative that, that Dina had just mentioned, uh, this dehumanizing, and uh, degrading idea of Muslims and Palestinians. So we're kind of at a peculiar time, and I'm sure you've noticed that 
Uh, I'm sure many of you have been contributing to the struggle, to the contrib contributing to the recognition of Palestinian human rights by taking to social media, by trying to educate others, educating your friends. Um, we've seen this proliferation of the Palestinian narrative uh, on a grassroots level, that communities of color, communities of conscience are responding well to our our posts, our messages, everything that we're trying to circulate about Palestine. And yet at the same time, as I've mentioned, we're seeing institutional and systemic support for a settler colonial uh, white supremacist ideology. Um, so the question is, what is the trajectory of our community? What is the trajectory of the struggle for uh, Muslim civil rights in this country? What I wanted to mention is that we do not live, you know, we, we need to throw down, throw away this, this myth that we live in a post-racial society because that doesn't exist. Um, the fight and struggle against white supremacy and discrimination has existed in this country since its inception. But I am hoping in the future, uh, what this moment is bringing us closer to is finally uh, a sort of a recognition of what Israel and what its supporters in our political system, as well as, you know, individuals, what they're actually suggesting, you know, what they're actually um, promoting. Uh, the violence that not only, uh, uh, the violence that not only manifests on the bodies of Palestinian Muslims in Gaza, but also the subsequent violence uh, that happens here to American Muslim bodies when powerful institutions promote these uh, degrading and dehumanizing tropes and ideas about Muslims. Uh, so, inshallah, your, your perseverance, your steadfastness, your continued contribution to important uh, organizations like MPAC, like Kerala, uh, your continued activism is what's going to carry us towards uh, a moment in which we are closer to finally defeating the specter of white supremacy, discrimination, and racism. And also, very quickly, I just want to, how am I doing on time? 30 seconds. Okay. Um, uh, I guess I'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay, okay. So what I was really briefly going to say is that we're in a unique position because we're the only settler colonial society. So when I say settler colonial, I mean like New Zealand, like Canada, uh, like uh, the state of Israel. Um, in which it's an, uh, basically a state that's founded on the uh, exclusion of the indigenous population. We're the only um, settler colonial society that will have a majority non-white population by 2050. And we can convert that into... <laughs> and, and we need to be intelligent about that and convert that into political power by making alliances based on mutual love, respect with other vulnerable communities of color who are also dealing with these specters, who are also challenging the specter of, of racism and classism and other forms of discrimination. And, uh, you know, let's make sure that it's not, we want to make sure it's not transactional. It's based on mutual love and respect of those communities and a recognition of their value. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you. Time's going by fast, but really appreciate all your comments. Um, we'll start the moderated Q&A portion, and we would love to have had more time for this panel, uh, but unfortunately, there's only so much we can pack in, so apologize for how quickly we're moving through, but inshallah, we are doing good on time, and so the plan would be for me to ask you all one question each, two minutes to answer. Um, Dina, you get three, because you went short. Uh, seriously, I mean that. Um, and, and after that, we'll go to audience Q&A. So I'll go ahead and make uh, for Harun the first question. So we all saw what happened on January 6th. And clearly, in my view, the true terrorists and the ones who actually could damage America were the white supremacists who broke in and did what they did. Yet it seems like the US government continues to focus on us, American Muslims, as a security problem. Going into the next election, and if Trump, doesn't matter if he wins or loses, because he's going to think he won. Um, and we're a 501c3, so we're not endorsing who you vote for. I'm just making an observation in my own personal capacity. But you've served in senior roles at the DHS. How do we prepare? How does our country prepare for something like that, as dangerous as that? Look, uh, anybody who tells you in the last seven to eight years specifically that 
white supremacy or domestic terrorism emanating from white supremacy has not been the top counterterrorism threat to this country is lying. So that is just based on the data, that is based on law enforcement agencies at the local, state, and federal level. Now, you know, I was in DC uh, uh, just recently, a few weeks ago, and unfortunately, the, the temperament of the city, the temperament of counterterrorism officials, national security apparatus, is a bit giddy almost that, oh man, we have a Middle Eastern terrorism problem potentially brewing again, and folks can start dusting off their strategic plans and, and everything that you know, communities like ours have been through. We need to refuse that premise, okay? This is, again, this is data. There are subject matter experts that keep the data. That data will only, will only start uh, uh, swaying even more uh, to the uh, side of domestic terrorism as unfortunately the election season uh, carries on. We see what's happening even today, right? We see what's happening with some of the candidates in the Republican National Committee or the debates, how they are speaking, right? This is hate speech. This is, there's no other way around it. And what is that gonna do? We see the incidents now uh, as, as my colleagues from CARE uh, are, are keeping tabs on. And so, look, engagement is going to be key but it's also going to be key for us not to go in and retreat. This is not a time to retreat. We need to be responsible. We need to have responsible leadership to be able to engage with law. I know, and, and everybody may not agree with this, but specifically when I was in government, uh, when I was in national security, there were certain communities that made it easy for policymakers as in like, hey, we're gonna produce this white paper for you that's basically what we want you to take to Congress. Or here's a white paper for, uh, you know, Mr. Policymaker, most of secretary, that we think, you know, a lot of your constituents would really like. And then there's folks who, who you know, made it difficult. I think we need both of that. We need an inside and an outside game. We need the scholars from our community to start writing about domestic terrorism, to start writing about the impact of hate on our communities and elections, because there's also funding that come out of the, the foundation side and the nonprofit side and the university side to help amplify the voices of our communities. And so whatever position we are in, professionally, we need to take advantage of that, okay? And that's one thing I wanted to say, just because uh, we're seeing Sorry, one, one last point. Uh, we're seeing a lot of hate and a lot of civil rights abuses at every level right now. It's permeating from schools, from school children. Corona Del Mar, I don't know if you guys saw what happened there. Read it, it's ridiculous. Um, all the way to law firms that we said. It's incumbent on those of us who have less risk and make, it, make, make, an, ass make an assessment of your own risk. If, if you have less risk, if you're a business owner or you're older, you know, we can't put that burden on just our college students. I think that's unfair. That's unfair of a, on us as a community to put the burden of our community, our civil rights, civil liberties struggle on our youth who are just starting out in this society. And so make an assessment. If you can do stuff, talk to the leadership of MPAC and others and say, what can I do? Is that an op-ed? Is that a meeting? Is that me going doing a sit-in? What is that? That burden cannot just be on our youth. Excellent. Excellent, thank you. Um, and to Haroon's point, Salam Mariati, um, I and another Muhammad Ali, who's our director in DC, we met with the FBI last year, this year, pardon me, earlier this year, and they told us in this closed door meeting that the United States has become the biggest, greatest exporter, or the big, biggest exporter of white, white domestic supremacy hate in the world. So literally other hate groups are looking at our hate terrorist groups or hate groups, white supremacist groups as models of what they used to use. That's how shocking it is, but we asked them to make sure that Christopher Ray testifies that in Congress. So we're working on that, we need your support. The great point, thank you for that. All right, um, moving over to Dina now. Dina, I've got a kid who's in high school, 15 years old. He did a fundraiser with his MSA, they sold Krispy Kreme donuts, and somebody had River to the Sea on one of the posters, and the school shut down the, the fundraiser got all the money and did an investigation for five days as to where this was going, because parents complained. I've got a kid at Georgetown, he's 21, he's afraid to speak out because doxing trucks are going around there as well. I'd love to hear for those of us who have kids, what advice are you giving at CARE as to what should we be telling our kids to do or not do? Where's that line? 
It's a difficult question um, for the same reason that Haroon said that each one of us has different degrees of privilege and each one of us has has to make a different assessment of risk. Um, there are definitely laws in place that protect students, if we're talking about students, whether K through 12 or students on college campuses, regarding their ability to freely express themselves, right? Free speech, to freely express their religious beliefs, because for a lot of us, pro-Palestine advocacy is inextricably intertwined with our Muslim faith and identity. Um, there are laws that protect students against discrimination and harassment based on their protected characteristics. So if these children are Palestinian, you know, or if they can tie what they're doing with their religious faith, there are laws that protect them. So it, it really is a case-by-case -case analysis, and I would tell anyone who's experienced harm um, to definitely reach out and consult with an attorney um, who, can, who can guide you through that process. But more importantly, I think that we really want to try to minimize the harm before it occurs. So unfortunately, in my depressing line of work, well, I'm a hopeful person, but it, it, a lot of it is very depressing because I see people once the harm has already occurred, right? And that is a very difficult place to be in. But I want to remind people that at this moment in time to be very mindful of what legal protections exist in the setting that you are in. So in employment settings, there are specific legal protections that exist. If you're a private employee, you are not protected by the free speech provisions of the First Amendment. Remember that. Your private employer can terminate you for political speech and political activity in many cases. In California, we do have a few more protections than exist in federal law, but it's still a precarious situation, right? Um, be aware of what, is, what organizations are, have been cast categorized as terrorist organizations by the United States government. Be very mindful of the language that you are using. I would say that we are also, as a Muslim people by faith, um, Nyla said this during her presentation, which I really appreciated. We are a people of reason and we are a people of intellect. We are ummat al-wasat. We are the, the people of moderation. Remember that. By people of, as people of faith, we are people that are taught that the best of us are those with the best characters and the best manners. Remember that when you're engaging in conversation and dialogue. Do not go to a level in which you are betraying your faith and your humanity. Um, and the love and respect that Shaheen is talking about that you should have for fellow, for fellow, um, your fellow human beings. So I want people to be mindful. I want people to exercise reason. But like Harun was saying also, and like I said earlier in my remarks, this is a time for tremendous courage. And like the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that if you see an act of evil, if you can change it with your hand, meaning if you can act, act. And if you can't act, but if you can change it with your tongue, if you can speak, speak. And if you can't change it with your tongue, then the weakest of iman, but I also think at times takes tremendous courage, if there is something in your heart that needs to change, change what's in your heart, or use your heart and use your, use your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to try to change. Because, you know, I plan and you plan, but Allah is the best of planners. Um, and with that aside, I would say if anyone does have a specific situation and I can help you walk through it or assess it, don't hesitate to contact me, approach me, talk to me about it. Because like I said, a lot of these cases are case by case and I'm happy to walk through specific fact patterns. But I hope that that was helpful. Thank you so much. Uh, we know how busy you are at CARE, and, and for you to make that offer is extremely important. Thank you for that. Um, turning over to Sister Marguerite, um, in your initial poll, I don't know if Australia is a continent or not. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> betraying my geography. But any Australians or New Zealand Kiwis in here? All right, none. Oh, there is. Sorry to have. Very, I'm glad we asked that. Thank you. All right. so. So, Marguerite, I'm going to ask you a question that's going to be probably the, one of the tougher ones here. Um, so we talk about coalition building, but in Chicago, for example, the conservative side of my family are saying that there's no way they're going to vote for 
any Democrat. And again, we're 501c3, and we're not saying who you vote for. We just want to think through these issues, because they're like, we're not going to vote for somebody who's going to take away my parental rights, take out the playbook of all the dangers of what's going to happen to our kids and what's out of control. And I understand California probably has some of those issues as well. So how do you build a coalition that you can work within without setting aside your moral values, your Islamic values? Do those even come into play? How do you work across those bridges to do what's best for our community, our country? We'd love for you to tackle that, please. Ooh, oh, wow. Yeah, that, that is a very different. Minutes, two minutes. In two minutes. So, um, yeah, so some of my, my training is in community organizing, so faith based community organizing, so Alinsky style organizing, which is like congregational. So, so there's like when it comes to certain things outside of Muslims, right? Like where we know, like we're allies, like in the Quran, where it says allies, the Muslim, you know, Muslim men and Muslim women are allies of one another, and we enjoin what is good and forbid what is wrong. So it's like you know we are permanent allies here, right, in this room. But when it comes to like other issues, there are no permanent, like there's no permanent allies, right? There's only per permanent self-interest, right? Like as far as, and it may seem like the whole idea of like self-interest may seem a little bit selfish, but really understanding like at the core, like foundation, what do we need to live in a pluralistic society? And knowing that we could be in a genocidal moment, knowing that like, so so many of you raised your hands, right? And who are like Asian American, I see a lot of South Asians here. So not only are we dealing with the forces of white supremacy, right? We're actually dealing with, with global movements of ethno-religious states States, right, so in Palestine, it's Zionism. Um, in South Asia, right, you have like Hindutva, which is like one of the biggest purveyors of Islamophobia. Here, we also have white supremacy. There's also Han supremacy, right, affecting like Uyghurs and Uyghur activists, and all of those. They're all working together, right, targeting, right, surveilling. Like, so we have a lot of non-like so states that are actually impacting all of us. And so when we're thinking about like what is important, what do we need to prioritize as Muslims, we need to really think about the existential threat of us as a community here and think about like what has happened, right? We are in a settler colony where there were, have been people that have been wiped out and that we are living on those missions that are doing, like we are living, like many of the institutions, we are living on their bones and continual resistance and resilience of indigenous peoples. But our own fate here is really tied up into the solidarity, is multiracial coalitions and understanding, understanding what power is, that power concedes nothing without demand. That's Frederick Douglass, right? Understanding these kind of issues and how do we hold elected officials accountable? Checking out is not going to get us there, but holding them accountable and building power is really key. And first and foremost is really building relationship so that we can have the multiracial, multi-faith coalitions, and that includes in a lot of the interfaith work that we have to understand people that we're organizing with they may turn on us when it comes to their own self-interest, but it is our job as organizers to expand their self-interest to say, you may think you're getting somewhere by taking the white supremacist playbook, but you have to divest in the oppression of Muslims. You have to divest in the oppression of indigenous peoples globally. Like you have, we have to be committed. If we want a world where our children have a chance in the future global apocalypse, like, I mean, it's really like environmental stuff is a big deal. And we need to start centering that because like, you know, Palestine is, is an environmental justice issue. The ways that they're investing in military, that is a major issue. So when we make those connections, when we have those folks expand their self-interest, for them to understand what we need to center for our civil rights, I think we can get there. But that takes deep relationship, a deep understanding of what organizing is, and that's regular people being involved in that process. Great, thank you. So you're asking us to vote for, I'm just kidding, don't answer that. All right, we get it. Um, Faisal, you're a law professor, and when I was in law school, a lot of law professors picked on me, so now's my turn to pick on you. I'm going to give you a subpart question, uh, two minutes still. The first one is, can you help us understand First Amendment rights and private public? And then the second part is, what if Trump wins? What should we be doing today? God, uh, okay, uh, personally speaking, God forbid, if he wins, 
what do I do personally? I'd love your advice, please. So let me, uh, uh, I, I used to teach a course on journalism. And what I used to teach the students is when the interviewer asks a question you don't want to answer and you want to educate them about something else, okay. speak about it. So I'm going to speak about something else. Uh, okay. So what I want to talk about is the, the, a point was made by Haroon that uh, uh, students are being put in the forefront of doing a lot of the work, right? And that is going to be the reality, unfortunately, just because they're there, they're activists. And what we need to do is to give them training, education, on what they can say, what they cannot say. There's a center at Rutgers University which has put together resources. So if you have students in universities, please, uh, you know, get in touch with MPAC. I'm sure, get, get in touch with me. You can add me on LinkedIn. Have your students get in touch with me. I would like to provide them those resources on what they can say, how they can speak, because they will be doing it, okay? So we want to train them to be the foot soldiers out there. And, and, and it's not, here's the thing. Change, most change have come from universities. The Vietnam War ended with protests in university campuses. Apartheid, all over the world was opposed. The last place was opposed was in the United States. Where did it start? On university campuses. So that's something that the Zionists know, and they have been targeting every single campus to shut down any kind of protest. So our job is to provide the resources to these students. Don't just them go out there and then when they get caught, when they get busted up and you know, just leave them alone. No, we need to be there providing that support. So we're having those resources available and the community has to come and stand behind them so that they can keep pushing within the limits. As a sister said, we're Muslims. We don't want to go to extremes. All we're doing, no more killing, ceasefire. We are not calling for anti-Semitism. But the moment you oppose genocide, the moment you say ceasefire, you're being branded an anti-Semite, and we have to push back. We can't lay low on this issue, and the students are doing it, so we need to provide them the support. And that's what I would say, and I hope we can encourage them to do that. Excellent, thank you. It's great advice. Um, Shaheen, turn it over to you. Would you mind speaking about your Irvine 11 experience and how it contrasts with what you were doing and, and what, how you were treated compared to how one of the last presidential candidates came to speak and what was his experience when people were protesting him? and the difference. Absolutely. Um, so what I wanted to say is I started my, um, I guess, leap into activism by reading about, you know, the situation in, in Palestine and, and reading about these, you know, um, uh, crimes against humanity, essentially. And I remember distinctly reading in Noam Chomsky's Fateful Triangle, which was published in the 90s. There was words like apartheid and, and accusations of genocide that were, at the time, restricted to obscure academic, you know, uh, restricted to academia and, and obscure professors. Now it's become... A, as I had just mentioned, you know, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, uh, the Harvard Legal School, as well as Beit Salem, Israel's most prominent non-government organization, have all branded Israel as an official apartheid state. And not to take away from the Palestinian activisms who have been, you know, basically screaming this for decades, but the point is that the political spectrum, or I, feel, uh, I should say the political discourse on this topic has shifted. So when we performed our protest, um, in, in some ways, some things have, have uh, gotten a little, hopefully momentarily, only momentarily worse. But what I was going to say is, one thing that's common is it's still social, as, as some of my co-panelists have just mentioned, it's still socially unacceptable to recognize the humanity of Palestinians. There's this absolute dehumanization of uh, Palestinians in our political establishment, and our mainstream media. Um, so unfortunately, that has been a, a, common, uh, a common thing. But what I'm saying is that um, just as it happened with South Africa, there was this momentum that was built internationally in opposition towards these horrendous crimes. It, we're witnessing that same momentum build for the issue of Palestine. And, not, and by extension, also sympathy and, and solidarity with Muslims. I mean, we're seeing 
a uh, record number of people, I'd never even considered this, it wasn't at the forefront of my mind, but people are actually largely uh, converting to Islam, social media influencers, personalities, just because of the resilience and bravery and courage of Palestinians in Gaza, but also of their supporters and allies in you know, Western nations like the United States. So um, th to put it simply, uh, things are changing for the better, but at the same time we're seeing this like, uh, severe repression from those who have a vested interest in the longevity of the apartheid state of Israel, if, if that makes sense. That's great, thank you. I think that um, we're, we're pretty much done with time. I, I love what you ended with. In Chicago, when I do talk to audiences of this nature, I always point out that after 9-11, I didn't know who to call. We literally had no structures, anything built. MPAC was there. I knew about MPAC's work. This year, this month, when Wadea, the six-year-old Palestinian kid was was murdered brutally, we wrote something to the White House and within 30 minutes we got a message back saying the president's working on an address. Now, alhamdulillah, we have made so much progress, so it's not all doom and gloom. We certainly are in the middle of our fight. But alhamdulillah, to it, like 20 years ago, like Harvard now, their major benefactors, donors, who are resigning, who gave millions to Harvard, are resigning because Harvard, they feel, is not going far enough. That's tremendous achievement. When I went to law school, there were no Supreme Court clerks of, our, of our gen, my generation. Now we have two, three, or four who've been through it. Much. We may, inshallah, in 20 years have Supreme Court justices. We may have the next Elon Musk, if you will. So my message to our community is, let's be the best we can be. Let's double down on our community. We have the best minds in this next generation and do not lose hope, what they said. Because in 20 years, imagine how much better off we will be. It's the long game here. Thank you, tremendously. Thanks.